It's a me, Mr. B, and I'm going to talk about part two now of classical civilization in the Mediterranean, which is Rome. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to remind you, back across the sea on the Peloponnesian Peninsula, the Greeks were kind of the foundation for classical civilization in the Mediterranean. That started to come to an end, I would say, with the Peloponnesian War when the Spartans beat the Athenians. The Spartans were much better at military matters than they were at governing, uh, so it just... Uh, Pretty much weakened the peninsula as a whole because the Spartans weren't effective administrators. But that just opened the door for Philip II of Macedon and later, of course, Alexander the Great to take over the region and begin to create the Hellenistic period. So I'm going to jump right on over here to part two and we're going to look at Rome. And what we see is right as the Greek Dark Ages are, are kind of wrapping up, that was the time period during which Homer was lamenting the loss of heroes. We see uh, there's a lot of Greek settlers that had come across the sea to live on the Italian peninsula down at the kind of the bottom of the boot. And those Greek settlers, of course, brought with them language and cultural ideas and things like that, the religion. And if you remember the Phoenician alphabet, the Greek alphabet, the Roman alphabet, our alphabet, that little transition, they brought with them a lot. And the Romans used that kind of as a, a building block amongst other things. But there's a monarchy on the peninsula. You might remember the tale of R Romulus and Remus who were raised by a wolf. They fought one another, and Romulus ended up killing his brother, naming the city after himself. And so really this is the beginning of the foundation myth for the Roman city, Rome. Uh, but really it was the Etruscans. Th these were the people who were the monarchs. They introduced a writing system. They introduced the religion. They introduced some engineering feats like the arch and some of the things that the Romans were later known for almost extensively, because the Greeks, while we look at them, because they were uh, masters of the mind, the Romans, we could say, might be masters of materials. They were very good engineers and architects, and they, that's why we see the monumental architecture like the Colosseum, the Circus Maximus, the aqueducts. So there's an old saying, all roads lead to Rome, and there was a reason for that because the Roman Empire spread so far, but it's also kind of conveniently centrally located on the peninsula. Um, I'm going to move over here for a second so you can kind of see some of the population of the early settlers. The Greeks down here, as I said, down on the tip of the boot. Then you have the Etruscans up in the north. And interesting, there's people that are called Latins, hint, hint, language. Um, and they all kind of, kind of congregate in the central area. This is a nice location. Uh, location, 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 as, this, as the saying goes. Um, the Roman roads, what's really interesting is that they built roads as they conquered and expanded so that their military would have easier transport and transportation and um, mobility. And some of those roads are still visible. Uh, there's a very famous famous one called the Via Appia, the Appian Way. So the Etruscans were overthrown in the 500s BC, and the people who overthrew them wanted to institute a new form of government, and sort of how we saw the Greeks testing different things and the Athenians kind of triumphing with democracy, the Romans created the Republic. The, the, this should sound familiar because this is what the United States of America is. The founders looked at the Mediterranean classical civilization and wanted to duplicate it because that was sort of the tail end of uh, the Renaissance where the rebirth of Greek and Roman culture inspired everybody. And with the Enlightenment and the discovery of all these uh, writings and uh, the mathematics, the science, and all that that the uh, Mediterranean cultures had, the founders wanted to turn to them because they figured they had some good ideas. Well, they knew democracy was going to be something that was difficult in this nation, so they came up with a republic, which is representatives, and that's what the Romans invented. Uh, and really what it was is, uh, we, you see here there's a word patricians and then plebeians. The patricians were the upper class. The patricians would kind of be like the Senate in our Congress. The plebeians would be kind of like the House of Representatives in our Congress. Uh, an upper house with wealthy landlords and a uh, lower house of kind of common people. So this was made up of wealthy people who were landowners, as I just said. And this was made up of um, farmers, merchant class, lower class people. And they were chosen as representatives from amongst the citizens of Rome. The way it worked is you have two consuls who are kind of like co-presidents. And then the patricians are in their senate. And then the plebeians have an assembly, and they all are sort of an advisory body. They work together. Uh, there's a lot of trouble, as we will see. But they have a written law that they – well, 
formula that they attempt to follow called the 12 tables. And this is important because the Romans provide law everywhere they go. And they, they essentially say, hey, as long as you do things our way, if you, if you follow our laws and pay your taxes, we'll leave you alone. Do your own thing otherwise. And the 12 tables were kind of the basis for that. And we see that come into play later uh, in importance with the Byzantine Empire, which we'll see shortly. This I'm going to skip. You can watch it on your own. Uh, it's a very funny, uh, horrible histories about the high turnover rate, I guess I could say, of rulers. Um, they were able to accomplish some of these. This thing is huge. This this is like a NASCAR track. It hold, it held, uh, I believe, somewhere in the upwards of 100,000 people. And we're talking thousands of years ago. They build a stadium, essentially. They could hold hundreds, uh, I'm sorry, 100,000 people, more than 100,000 people, for entertainment, to watch races. And then these are all statues of uh, emperors and whatnot. This is where it is today. Uh, if you are, go to Rome ever, if I do a tour, for instance, and you want to come along, you can actually see something that is the ruins, of course, of something that's thousands of years old. Pretty cool. This is an aqueduct where they, as I mentioned, with their engineering abilities, the Romans were able to bring water from faraway places to water to where they needed the water. So they built these aqueducts. It was basically plumbing. The Romans had like indoor plumbing. Again, thousands of years ago, they were very advanced. And it's still standing, which shows how powerful they were uh, or how uh, good they were. Now, the Punic Wars. This is where you can see the beginnings here. Um, so we're looking at like right around the Han Dynasty, um, right around when the Spartans are, uh, like 20 years later, the Spartans are fighting the Persians and all that at 300. Um, Rome was busy fighting this city-state here of Carthage for control of the Mediterranean trade routes. Whoever could control this region would be the one that, ro that rose. So it was either going to be the Roman Empire or the Carthaginian Empire. Obviously, you guys know who won because we didn't have a Carthaginian Empire after that. This is uh, some of the famous um, stories that we get from famous generals, like the Carthaginian general Hannibal. Uh, and what he did was he crossed the Alps. It was thought... It was impossible to invade Italy because anywhere you go on the coast, you're going to attack. So he said, well, you know what? I'm just going to invade this way. So he came across the Alps, and he, or tried to come across the Alps, I should say. And he did so with elephants, big, heavy loads that they could carry. Uh, but unfortunately, while their great general was away, the Romans figured, hey, Carthage is wide open, ripe for attack. So they attacked while Hannibal was up this way. And so he had to kind of beat a hasty retreat, and that saved Rome. Let me move this way. There we go. Uh, oh, this is the, as he came across the Alps, what I just talked about. Uh, so, Rome obviously won. <clears throat> and it's said that they so defeated, they so eliminated the Carthaginians as a threat that they razed the city, R-A-Z-E, uh, which means they basically flattened it. They destroyed it, ran everybody out, or killed anybody that was left. And then it said that they were, wanted to make sure the Carthaginians never posed a threat again, so they plowed salt into the fields around Carthage so that the, no one could ever farm there again, which meant no one could ever live there again. Uh, that's a historical anecdote that's kind of cool. So, life wasn't always peachy keen, even though it was an empire and it was very wealthy and they had control of the trade routes. And there was a couple of brothers called the Gracchi. Anytime you have a U.S., you know, in Latin, you got it like fungus, fungi. Well, the Gracchus brothers would be called the Gracchi. Uh, and they proposed some reforms to try to help the poor uh, in particular. And they were very popular because there was a lot of poor and not many people were paying attention to them. Uh, so they offered things uh, like, like land um, and different tax reforms, things like that. And they were very popular with the people, not with the fellow senators and rulers. And they were assassinated. Womp womp. Uh, so then this, what we see results eventually along the way. Rome, Rome had some trouble with keeping power in uh, keeping the safety, security, and stability, the three S's. And we see a civil war break out, and there's something called the triumvirate to try to stop the civil war. And the triumvirate, tri, the three, was Pompey, Crassus, and Caesar. And what ends up happening is Crassus is killed, so it comes down to Caesar versus Pompey. Wait. Okay, sorry, that was kind of messed up there because it talks about Cicero instead of the civil war, but whatever, you guys are cool. Uh, so Cicero was a philosopher. We saw a lot of philosophy with Greece. That's not something that the Romans were particularly known for, but they did have some big ones. And Cicero was a particularly important one, and he talked about political ethics and the duties of citizens. Um, but this is where I was trying to go. Uh, 
Caesar is a very popular, Julius Caesar is a very popular general, and he's off in Gaul, which is now France, and he basically uh, mutinies or, or rebels, and he says he's going to come take power for himself. And there's a law that if he brings his troops across the Rubicon River that he's basically an outlaw, he's breaking the law. So now there's a saying today called crossing the Rubicon, which is sort of like going past the point of no return. He brought his troops across the Rubicon, which made him effectively an outlaw, and it was an all-out brawl as Pompey and Caesar are fighting basically for control of the Roman Republic, for the Roman Empire. As you might know, Caesar won, but it didn't last very long because uh, he made ever-increasing moves to increase his own power, and that, and, and the poor, of course, loved him, so he was doing more things for the common people, which the senators did not like, and as you probably are familiar, he's murdered, stabbed uh, on the Ides of March, and his friend Brutus, as Shakespeare said, et tu Brute. So, Caesar's gone. I'm going to skip this. Which leads to a second triumvirate. He has kind of an adopted son, sort of, uh, named Augustus. Uh, and Mark Antony was his best friend, and then Lepidus was another general. And these three guys get together, and they're like, we're going to go get all those people who killed Caesar. So they, they attempt that. Well, what ends up happening is Mark Antony meets a beautiful, lovely lady named Cleopatra. He sort of takes up against Augustus. They end up losing. Cleopatra puts a snake against her breast, a poisonous snake that kills her. He falls on his sword and dies. Lepidus is out of the picture eventually by that point anyway, uh, for more. And then so Augustus becomes Augustus Caesar. I'm going to skip this. And this creates the Roman Empire. Now there is a Caesar. Augustus now means great. Um, in fact, the month, the months of the year, June, July, August, are Roman. Julius Caesar gave us July. Augustus gave us August. And then September, October, like oct means eight. November, Novum, nine. So there used to be, that was the, that was the 10th month, and then December, or I'm sorry, December was the 10th month, and November was the 9th, and so on, but it shifted because they added some months. Kind of cool. Anyway, so Augustus Caesar creates the Roman Empire, and under his rule, it enters into a term you've already seen, which I talked about with the Han and with the Gupta as well. It's sort of like a, a golden age, the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, or the peace of Rome. Skipping this as well. And the Roman Empire by the year 44 is... Or BC is huge. It covers spans three different continents, so it's quite substantial. And this is where the saying that I mentioned earlier: "All roads lead to Rome." They built roads everywhere they conquered, and so they almost literally all ended up back at Rome. Uh, what we see also happen here is another major world event, which is the beginning of Christianity. It started over here, tiny little breakaway sect they thought of Judaism, and it popped up in pockets early on. Uh, but then, after the year three in the three hundreds. Uh, it was illegal before then, and that's where you saw um, the gladiator games and things like that where Christians being persecuted. But after it became officially accepted with an emperor named Constantine, um, it wasn't persecuted, and it, and it spread very rapidly. And then it became the official religion of the Roman Empire under a guy named Theodosius. So the uh, everywhere the Roman Empire was, Christianity was. That's a major event that we'll see and we'll talk about more later. Now, Rome has problems. It begins having... So many problems that one of the emperors says, I need to, it's too big. we got to split it in half. So he did. There was the Western Roman Empire where there was kind of a co-emperor. And then there was the Eastern Roman Empire. Well, it didn't quite work out very well. This was already on the downward spiral. If you remember the dynastic cycle from China, this is the end of the dynastic cycle for Rome. Once it's divided, this area is still fairly stable and strong. They have along the Greek history here. This is where they start to have the problems with like invasions and uh, barbarians coming in. Uh, they're getting attacked on all fronts. This was easier to maintain and hold. This is what collapsed. So when we talk about the fall of Rome, we actually talk about the western half of the empire. The eastern half stayed, and we'll see more of that in Chapter 9 with the Byzantine Empire. Um, and here's the Byzantine Empire, a little map. So we have, say the ending date of Rome is officially 476. I will give more of this detail in class, and you can get some more out of your notes and use Google, your best friend, to find some more details. And then we'll talk in Chapter 5 about the collapse, the decline of classical civilizations. That's it, the end. I hope you guys have a great day.